Hi, my name is Taylor Hansen, and I'm a technical solution specialist at Cisco. Today, I'm going to talk about how to use OAuth, and specifically, OAuth through the authorization code flow. I know copying links from a video is hard, so before I go any further, I'd like to draw attention to the two links I've posted here and give a second to take a screenshot. Both links refer to Python code samples that you can use to get a clear picture of how this OAuth authorization code flow works. I also want to mention that both of these repos exist under the WXSD sales organization on GitHub.com. First, what is OAuth? It's simply a way for users to sign into your app. I'm a fan of Dungeons and Dragons, so I've posted a screenshot of what the DND Beyond sign in page looks like. In that screenshot are three OAuth flows, one for each account type. We see these all the time when apps give us the option to sign in with Facebook, Google, or Apple. I'll refer to these as OAuth services or providers going forward. A couple of reasons we'd want to use OAuth are because, first, it gives us a unique to token to associate with a user without us ever having to know the user's password or other credentials. This is because the user enters their password into the service provider that they selected, and that provider gives us a token in return to identify the user. And second, because that token can optionally be used to access certain features of the service provider. What I mean by certain features of the service provider are generally referred to as scopes. For example, that part in a mobile app that says the app wants to access your camera, microphone, or location are all scopes. When you, the user, hit accept, the service provider is then giving the app a token that is able to access those scopes on your behalf. So we've covered what OAuth is and why it's useful. But how do we as developers implement it? It can be fairly confusing before we get the hang of it. So let's dive in and clear it up. First, we need to know through which service provider we want our users to sign in. Microsoft, Google, WebEx. The choice here is often obvious depending on what our application does. For example, if the app joins WebEx meetings, then we have our answer. Then we register our app with that service. These screenshots are what the developer platform for various services can look like when you're setting up your application. This can be done before any code for your app is even written. When we do this, we will get a client ID and secret we'll need to use later. I want to note that there are different types of OAuth flow that operate differently. Implicit flow, for example, is considered to be outdated and insecure. Client credentials is a bit simpler than what we are talking about today, which is the authorization code flow. This is a common OAuth flow. It's secure and requires more than one step from your application, so it can be easy to feel lost, which is why this flow will be our focus. We can think of the authorization code OAuth flow as having a few steps. First, a user clicks a link or a button that will send them to the OAuth service provider with a slash authorized URL. The user enters their account credentials, including their password with that service provider. Second, only after the user successfully signs in will the service provider give our application a code. Third, our application exchanges that code for an access token. This is done through a post request and keeps our application secret hidden from the user. More simply, we're looking at two steps. One, send the user to the slash authorized URL, and two, exchange the code for an access token. So let's start with step one. Building the authorized URL where we'll send the user can look quite overwhelming. But if we look closely, there are usually only three or four parameters highlighted in yellow. Most of these parameter values are given to us by the service when we register our application, and the values in this step can be the same for every user that wants to use our app. It's important to note that all of the parameter values in this step must be URL encoded, highlighted in red. For example, HTTPS percent 3A instead of HTTPS colon. 
So let's take a step back and look at the URL parameters. The base URL will be the URL specified by the OAuth service documentation. For example, webexapis.com slash v1 slash authorize. The client ID is given to us after we create or register the application with the service provider. The response type should always be the string code, C-O-D-E in this case, as it refers to the OAuth flow type we're using. Redirect URI is where our application code lives. In other words, this is the URL the service provider will use to send a user back to our app with a unique code after that user signs into the service. This step is tricky because we often don't have a hosted location for our app while we're developing, and we need to know it when we register our app with the provider. Most providers will allow you to set localhost as your redirect URI while building, or a third-party application like ngrok or ngrok can be used to get a public URL that tunnels to your development machine. Scopes are the features of the service your application wants to access and are sometimes not required in this step, depending on the provider. Once we've built our authorized URL, we can simply send the user there. This can be triggered by a sign in with button, a user clicks, or happen automatically if your app knows the user is not signed in. So that's it for the first step. And the good news is that like starting many new things, the most difficult part is behind us. The user has been redirected and is now signing into the service. And this part doesn't even involve your app, so it's not your problem. That is until the user successfully signs into the service. After the user signs in, they're redirected to the redirect URI that you specified in the first step. I know, it's another ugly URL. But the only thing we need is the code parameters value, so your app simply needs to be able to read the URL parameters. If you are testing this manually with something like localhost, then you can simply copy the code out of the address bar in your browser. With that, we're on our way to the last step. We just need to exchange that code for an access token, and then we're done. To do that, we need to make an HTTPS POST request to the slash access token endpoint specified by the service provider's documentation. This POST will need to be sent as form URL encoded. There are five form fields sent with this POST request, and by now, we know what all of their values should be. Grant type should be the string authorization underscore code. Client ID and secret were given to us when we registered our app with the provider. Code is the value we just copied from the last step. And redirect URI is the same URL we sent in step one, but this time it is not encoded. And here's what those values might look like with test data. Note that a code usually expires within minutes of receiving it, and can only be used to generate a token once, often even if your request to exchange it for a token fails for some reason. Here is what this last step might look like if you did it manually in Postman. I'm showing this to illustrate that you can generate an OAuth token manually, even if you don't have a web application set up to handle the flow automatically. You can see at the bottom, the response gave us our access token and a refresh token. That's it, we're finally done. We've received our token and can now make API requests to the service provider, assuming we enabled the correct scopes we need either through the app registration or somewhere in the OAuth flow itself, which is specified by the provider's documentation. The only major thing we didn't get to talk about today was how to refresh a token. Access tokens expire, but when that happens depends on the provider used. So it may be the case that we want to refresh our token automatically. The good news is that refreshing the token is an HTTPS POST request that looks almost identical to the request I showed in Postman, but instead of the code, you send the refresh token and change the grant type to be the string refresh underscore token. Thank you so much for your time. Before we go, let's take a look at one of those sample applications I linked at the very beginning, which I've pasted again here at the bottom. With this app, we can demonstrate the OAuth process as it might exist in a real application. First, I want to show you what the production integration for our app on developer.webex.com looks like. This exact integration is already registered with Webex and is what our live demo uses. 
You, as the developer, will also need to register your app with the service through which you want your users to authenticate. You can see we have an OAuth authorization URL here fully formed, which is nicely provided to us by WebEx. You may have to assemble this URL on your own for some other services. If we were to copy and paste this URL into our address bar, we would effectively be kicking off the same process I'm about to demonstrate. You can see that the URL includes the redirect URI, which I entered when this integration was registered prior to this video. This redirect URI is something I chose when building this app. I knew the production app's hosted location would be integration-samples.wbx.ninja, and I used slash webex-oauth as the handler in my application code. This is where WebEx will send the code we need for the user after the user logs into the WebEx service. Here is the repo for the demo I want to show today. When we click the link View Demo, we'll be able to use a live version of this app. The demo uses cookies to keep the user signed in for about one day, so we'll open a new private browser window to ensure we're starting fresh. You can see in the browser's address bar, I've already been redirected to idbroker.webex.com. This is because our demo app saw that there was no saved cookie for this browser session and assembled our slash authorized URL we needed to build in step one. The app sent me to that slash authorized URL immediately and Webex took care of sending me here. Our app isn't even aware of idbroker.webex.com. Now I'll sign in as one of my test users. Now that I've finished signing in, I'm redirected back to the initial demo page. What happened just there was WebEx redirected us back to the demo page with a code, specifically to the slash WebEx dash OAuth handler that is registered as the redirect URI for this integration. Our app took the code out of the URL and exchanged it for an access token, saved a cookie, and then it redirected us back to the main page of our app. As the user, we didn't even see the part with the code in the address bar because all that happened automatically with the corresponding redirects that took place. I want to show this same process again, but this time I will sign in with my Cisco account. I've been sent to idbroker.webex.com again, so we know the slash authorized URL for step one is done. This time, I get redirected to Cisco's single sign-on flow. This is another great thing about OAuth. The user's organization rules can still be followed, like the fact that Cisco uses SSO with WebEx, and our app can remain blissfully unaware of all of it. Duo authentication? No big deal. Our app doesn't know about it. As soon as I approve the sign-in from my mobile device, step two of the OAuth flow will be triggered. Our app will get a code to use on my behalf and exchange it for an access token all fairly quickly. Done. Now we can sign into an integration with a different service like Microsoft, Microsoft Azure in this case. Clicking sign in redirects us. Done with step one. Once we sign in, we're redirected back to our app. It received a code and exchanged it for an access token and stored it temporarily as a cookie. So if we refresh this page, we are still signed into both devices. That's it for me today. I hope I was able to make the OAuth authorization code flow a little bit clearer. And thank you once again for your time. Once again, my name is Taylor Hansen, and I work with the Center of Excellence in Cisco's Worldwide Sales Organization, and I'd be happy to hear from you.
Thank you.